You know, Dave, I find it really cool when peoples can put aside their differences, work together, and respect each other. Molly, if that's your way of saying how you feel about working with me, then right back at you. Peoples, Dave. I said peoples. I'm talking about when two cultures can collaborate to make sure that their history is preserved and their voices are heard. Ah, gotcha. And in this day and age, that's all the more inspiring. In BC, there's two First Nations groups, the Squamish Nation and the Little Watt Nation, who worked together to plan and build a shared cultural center that celebrated both groups' cultures and traditions. AMI's Vancouver team made the trip to beautiful Whistler, British Columbia on a snowy day to check out the museum. What they got was a welcoming team and an incredible tour. First Nations peoples are an important part of BC, and the Squamish Lilwat Cultural Centre in Whistler is aimed at sharing some of this heritage. The centre highlights the Lilwat Nation, who live north of Whistler in the Pemberton Mount Curie area, and the Squamish Nation, who live in the Squamish Valley and the North and West Vancouver areas. When I arrive, I'm greeted with a traditional welcome song. Alison Pascal, junior curator, introduces me to the center's permanent collection called What We Treasure. The first piece we're going to talk about is one of our largest carved cedar figures. And you might know it as a totem pole, but in our community, this represents a family pole or a family story. Uh, so our communities were an oral society and that we didn't have a written language until the 1970s. Instead, we would pass our history on through songs, stories, and dances, and also in our artwork. The family totem is 65 years old, 20 feet tall, and features a thunderbird, a bear, and a human face. Here at our cultural center, we do showcase some contemporary pieces, and the next two we'll be talking about were done by Annie Ross, and she's a teacher at Simon Fraser University. She works in the textile department. So over to my right is a life-size bear. It has been stuffed, and it's got a beaded dress with cones attached to it, but it might be a little bit easier for you to understand if you step in and see what it feels like yeah, for yourself. That would be great. Yeah, so just just forward, yep. There, yeah, there you go. So yeah, lots of. And those are glass, glass seed beads, and then there's also larger crystals. It's they're done in a diamond pattern. So if you feel there's some larger crystals oh, on them also. I see. And then of course the, the, the bear the herself. The yep. Which is very, <laughs> very huge. Yeah. And the animal on my left is a full-size mountain goat, and it's also covered in beads. And you can come in closer Great. and feel. Thanks. And so it's the same glass seed beads with the big crystals on it, and you could feel the fur. Yeah, it actually um, feels quite, mm -hmm. quite majestic, doesn't it? Yeah. We continued our way down the hall, which contained large rotating carvings, masks, and totems, as well as an impressive ocean-going canoe. It's 40 feet long, and I don't know exactly how wide it is, but you could fit two people sitting on the seat. Uh, we make all of our canoes out of one single tree. So this one is hollowed out, and then they put floorboards in, and then they also put seats back in. Uh, the carvers made it out of western red cedar, and this style is a hunting canoe. Uh, so it would have been used for hunting seals, sea lions, and otters. If we go to the okay. front, we'll see exactly what makes this uh, hunting canoe okay. feel out right here. This is where the hunter would stand from. So okay. he would stand at the front and throw a spear or a harpoon out. So it's like a, a it's raised platform. It's a platform, platform. yep. Yeah. And if we keep going to the front, feel down to the bottom, one underneath the canoe. Okay. Uh, go backwards a little oh. bit. This carved out section, it's so that the canoe cuts through the waves nice oh, and I easy. See. And if you keep your right hand going up the canoe, this is where they would store the spear or the harpoon so that it didn't uh, hurt anybody while they were traveling. Oh, that's smart. Mm -hmm. Just lay it down in mm -hmm. the, the little yeah. groove there. 
Allison and I then visited the Squamish Longhouse, where I was able to interact with various items, like a basket made of cedar root, wild cherry bark and swamp grass, a ceremonial vest to dance in, and I even got to play a drum. There's so much history and culture to experience at the Lil Watt Cultural Center. My takeaway was the thoughtfulness and intention that went into each creation I experienced, something that we often take for granted with our fast-paced, commercialized city lives. Wow, that center looks incredible. Molly, next time you're at West, are you going to plan a visit? Yeah, I think so. I really like museums that let you get tactile, and um, the tour Allison gave seemed great. And you can't get much more tactile than building a rope out of tree bark. If you really think about it, First Nations culture is very accessible to us, and it's not just about tactile art. It's about things like oral history, about song, about dance. Absolutely. The Little Watt Cultural Center is family friendly and has tours every hour. So if you would like to learn more, visit slcc.ca.